Awesome. Um, yeah, like, my name is Aravin, uh, and I'm just going to ramble about serverless. Uh, basically, like, what this is going to be is me talking about like, having built a startup. Um, I had a startup uh, called Link um, that was built sort of fully on uh, serverless, uh, almost all of it on AWS Lambdas, um, only in the like absolute last resort that we run the one thing that we couldn't get on Lambdas on, on sort of Docker. Um, and then Cloudflare required Blink sort of uh, late 2020. Um, and so I've been working at Cloudflare sort of ever since and one of the product managers uh, on our sort of developer platform. Um, so I'm doing a lot with Cloudflare workers. Um, and so it's, it's a bit of both. Uh, from all of all of those sort of two, uh, but what I'm going to talk about is not how to write a serverless function or on either Lambda or sort of Cloudflare workers. Um, this is more if you want to build an application on a serverless stack. This is some of the stuff that I've learned, um, and I'm, so um, also what this is going to be um, is sort of an extremely interactive -y thing. Um, as a presenter, online presenting is the worst in the world uh, because you don't have an audience and you don't get any sort of feedback. Uh, the one great thing that I loved about those things, those online presentations, is if it was a video that I recorded before and then we would watch it together because then we would have like really cool chats in the chat room uh, and I could do these like ask questions and answer questions along the way. So this is both, right? You're here, um, but we're also just gonna have a chat. Yeah. So I'm just gonna put up a statement there and then you can agree or disagree or go and ask a question. Um, yeah, clear? Yeah. Awesome. So what a serverless. Um, so here is the definition, uh, also known as my definition. Because uh, I'm sure we have sort of massively different um, interpretations, um, but it's run like a serverless is something that r runs my code in response to an event, whatever that event happens to be. It's built per invocation, right? And this is always where I get into lots of trouble with, with people that go like, ah, but my Kubernetes thing is serverless. And I go, no, no, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, you, know, you don't build per invocation, <laughs> right? Like I have to pay for the virtual machine that's sort of under it. Um, and it scales from zero to basically any load uh, seamlessly and instantly, um, and also the other way down. Yep. So, AES Lambda gets a mostly pass on these things. Um, that's my only dig at AWS for today. Because um, they actually have good stuff. Um, so yeah, um, anyone? Any questions about this? Think that you've missed? I've missed? Um, feel free. So when you look at that, that's great. We've got a sort of definition of serverless. But once you've written more than a few of these things, like you start to notice sort of patterns. And that's sort of what I've been noticing when I started building sort of applications on this. Um, come on. And the first thing you do is figure out what the hell this event is. Right? So it's about sort of parsing and validating an event, right? Then you may figure out that you need some more information, right? So you, you go off and do a request for some more information. And then there is like one point of logic where you now go, like I now know how I have all the information now, I'm going to decide on something. There's a, there's a bunch of logic in there. And that can lead to sort of one, or, one of two outcomes. Like either I save this decision somewhere or I send it somewhere. Like 
Um, sometimes you need to do both, uh, which is tricky, uh, but there's definitely sort of patterns to, um, to do that. Uh, more than happy to talk about that um, afterwards in a break. Um, because there's occasionally things where you have to say something in the database and then emit an event that you have like, done that. But this is basically what any serverless function is. Right? It's, um, and one of the great things that I love about it is like these are all like businessy things. Right? I can show this sort of to any of my stakeholders and they would be able to get it, right? Like if this particular thing happens, like this particular event happens, uh, we're going to look up some stuff and then we're gonna have some flow here, some if statements, and then we're gonna, this is gonna be the result. Yeah. So it's very much aligned to that, like that problem that you're trying to solve, right? That the objective of us is not to write lots of code, it's to solve problems, right? And this aligns really well with a part of a particular problem. Now, here's the first maybe slightly controversial one. Um, has anyone heard of the, the, like the term function as a service when it comes to serverless? It's not. Like serverless is not a function as a service. Right? Yes, it invokes a function. There's a function involved, obviously. But it's not about the functions. It's about the interconnections of those functions. It's how those functions fit together and do things that's at least as important as what that one function does. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's... Uh, my analogy is like... A function is a, is a neuron, which is rather useless unless you have a whole bunch of them. Right? And then their behavior depends on how you connect them together. Yeah. So that's what we, um, that's how I sort of think about like functions. Um, so it's basically BS uh, as a service, um, <laughs> which of course stands for business service. Um, as a service, right? But that's what it is, right? You can, and again, like once you start uh, sort of writing these sort of applications, uh, you can take a lot of these functions and go talk to like any of the, your customers even, or your sort of like uh, stakeholders, other stakeholders inside your organization, and go like, this is the thing that does this particular thing of the problem. Yeah, and this is how it fits with all the other ones. Um, it's also very unfortunate that no one is, as far as I know, is good at uh, visualizing this, right? Because we're all so damn focused on the functions. Uh, we're not focused on the, the big picture. Um, oh, and the other thing is like, we have a great way to share functions. It's called libraries. Like, that's how you share functions, right? Oh, which is also brings me to the point um, I, I saw this one today, uh, and I saw I needed to share that with you, so now you also know. Um, I saw a function as a service called to lowercase. I don't know what it does. I can guess what it does. And that's exactly what you don't want. Right? It's, it's a prime example of what not to do, because that's a function as a service. Right? To lowercase is a function. But that's not important. Like, what's important is what does it lowercase? From where to where? Like, that's what's important. So if you have logic that needs to happen in multiple serverless invocations, right? and I don't care whether they're lambdas or sort of Azure functions, Cloudflare workers, or anything else, like, make a library. Include that, or God forbid, copy and paste it, um, which is fine, by the way. Right. 
Any questions about that? Yeah? If we're not going to have any questions or like opinions, we're, it's going to be really... F like, like, well, we'll have some time to eat pizza sort of after this as well, so don't worry about it. Like, I'm fine. Yes. That's really interesting takeaway I get from that is that, again, <clears throat> that's what we kind of take from being, you know, things like thinking on one hand servers monoliths, on the other hand the two lower case, but actually thinking that when you have that mesh of different functions, the interconnectedness and the things they actually build and the value they create is where the functions value comes from. Exactly. And I just can't stress that enough. That's exactly what it is. It's that, like, the, fu the value is not in the functions. The value is in how you compose these functions. Like, that's where, that's where it's interesting. Another platform, serverless services like you know storage and those things like you need the whole lot as a whole to build that solution. So you're using other people's things. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. It's it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not just about like the, the the function there. Like it's also yeah, where where you store, where you send. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, well, that's actually one of the bigger takeaways. So. Well done. Um, so let's go talk about software implications. Like, how do you, like, how does it change the way that you, like, write software? Um, and the first thing is, like, your architecture um, has to radically change, um, unless you were doing um, sort of event-driven development in the first place. Um, but yeah, what happens is because everything uh, is triggered of, a, of an event, like you basically have very little choice in the matter to become sort of like sort of very much sort of event driven, um, which is great and it's amazing because a lot of the benefits that I'll be sort of talking about sort of later come from that event-driven nature that you have to have in these sort of applications. Yeah. Um, and just to like, be absolutely clear again, I'm talking about building like, applications, not a, not a small thing that changes an HTTP request from A to B. Right? Like this is, I want, to, I want to build sort of customer facing functionality on its own. Yeah. So it's event-driven. And um, I, years and years ago, I got into lots of fights with the, um, with the microservices people uh, because the microservices people thought that my services were too small to be called microservices. Um, so I guess they're, like, and, and it wasn't practical and, and it would never work. Um, so like they're nano services maybe. Um, but I just want to stress like how small these things are, right? Because, again, we're talking about parsing and validating an event. We're talking about potentially doing one or more um, outside requests for more information. Like, then it's some logic and then saving. Right? Like, that's it. With a few sort of libraries like, and some things, most of the services that I write these days hardly ever break 150 lines. Like that's sort of, that's a lot. Like for me, that's like a, geez, look at this one. I think it's 150 lines. This is a chunky one. I should maybe like have a few files in this particular thing. Yeah, so super, super small, doing one thing, doing one thing well. You're gonna stop me, right? At some point? We've got two more slides, then you'll, you'll stop me, hopefully. Um, so, here's one of the best implications of doing this. The way that you add features is by adding code. I don't need to change any existing code to add a new feature. What I need to do is I need to figure out which particular event I want to trigger on and then do my own thing. Yeah? 
so say that I want to send out a, uh, uh, an onboarding email when a new customer signs up. Right? You go and you find, like, oh, it turns out there's a, a new customer event. Right? And that does a, a whole lot of really important things around like setting up accounts and doing other stuff that we absolutely never want to break because it'd be very disruptive. But I'll just uh, hook in the like in that event, and it'll fire off my thing. That's now going to go to some SendGrid, any other sort of email service to send out an onboarding email. Yeah. At no point have I changed the original code that does all the important setting up of accounts. Yeah, it's extremely hard to undersell that point. This is massive, because I can now confidently push new features to production, because I know nothing will break, because it's an extra listener on an event. It's an extra consumer on that event. Um, there's nothing. I've changed nothing in that original flow. I don't need to be worried. And the other fun thing, uh, and I was, I was talking about um, uh, one of the other speakers at a conference um, I was at recently um, was talking about how uh, they stopped caring about code quality, like at all. And people go like, what? And it's, I, I, I knew exactly what he was on about. Because if I want to change existing code, it's almost always easier to rip out the entire thing and rewrite it than to change the original code. Right? Remember, we're talking about 150 lines here. Right? Most of that is pretty boring standard stuff. Right? So I'm happy. I have done this many times. So also, because you do one thing, like, I either need that thing done, or I don't. Right. But yeah, I have ripped out. Um, but the funny thing is, you first add the replacement. Again, like, you add the replacement. And you can test it. And go like, ah, like, this is exactly what the, uh, what the other thing does. And then you kill the other one. Yeah? Even if you want to update code, I usually never bother. Just rewrite the thing with what it should be. Yeah? Here's where we got to get into the good parts. Because you should never test unit test your functions. Don't bother unit testing your functions. The other one's going to be even better. Um, but remember, a function parses data. It maybe does some remote calls. It then executes some logic. And it then saves that thing. Right? Now, assuming you have a half-decent library that does your validation for you, right? you don't need to unit test that. Are you going to unit test the remote function call? No. Do you, need to unit, do you want to unit test that logic inside that function? Oh, probably, yeah. Yeah, that's actually, you might want to unit test that one. But the entire thing, end-to-end, -end, is not something you want to unit test. And here's the other kicker. The reason you don't want to unit but why do we unit test? Let's go to this. Like, why do we write unit tests? Because when you change the code, you want to make sure everything works. Yes. I want, like, it's, it's, it's finding sort of regressions, that if I change the code, that I changed something inadvertently. Do I 
ever change my code? No, I don't. So if I don't change my code, I don't get the benefit from test automation. Right? If it works, it works. Don't, don't touch it. Leave it, just leave it running. Right? So I never write, I may write unit tests for the logic bit if it's complex. But again, most of the, most of the functions are pretty straightforward functions that you can just eyeball. And what I'll do is I will test it in production instead. <laughs> right? And this is where it gets slightly more controversial than don't even unit bother unit testing. Um, but why not? Uh, has anyone sort of is anyone using a staging environment right now? Yeah, people are using staging environments. Uh, has there been a case ever that uh, something worked on staging but not in production? Yes, exactly. It happens all the fun times, right? And that's because things are subtly different. Um, so, and this is sort of at link, like the startup, um, I made it a rule, and this is great when you're the founder and CEO of a company, because you can make rules like this. Um, we would never have a test, we would never have a staging environment. Yeah, that was the rule. Link will never have a staging environment. And what we did was every time we felt like, oh. Maybe we should like spin up an environment to just test this in, because we could. Everything was like automated, but that was in the case if something sort of went wrong and we had to something disastrous went wrong and we had to spin the entire thing up again. So we had the we had the capability to spin up a staging environment. That wasn't the issue. But every time we felt like ah uh, maybe we should like spin up an environment just for like a couple hours, uh, we went, no, no. How can we test this safely in production? Because that's the thing. When I talk about testing in production, I don't mean, uh, well, it looks good. I looked at it. Johnny over there looked at it, and we think it's fine. Like, chuck it out there, right? Our customers will find the bugs. Like, that's, that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, what you want and I sort of alluded to this earlier, is what you want is the ability to run multiple versions of the same thing in production. Yeah. And so what we did is we had, a, like every, everyone that developed on, on sort of Link had their own set of accounts. And these would use the latest version of, or a specifically tagged version of some, some of the parts of our stack, right? So we could push something to production that would only be used by my accounts, right? Or by Glenn's accounts, yeah. or instead of both, right? So we could sort of test this, make sure it worked, and we had, like I didn't have one, we had, we each had like a half dozen of these things, and we're like, oh, I changed this particular thing, so I'll just use this particular account who has that set up, and then I can sort of test how this works. Yeah. So this isn't chuck it in production and see if anyone complains. This is run it in your production environment, but in a way that is safe, and none of your customers get affected. Or if they do, very few do. Right? we would occasionally sort of roll things out to our free users first, right? You get this for free. It worked on all of our accounts. Like, you try that. And if it, if it worked, we'd roll it out to everyone else. Hmm? Being able to run multiple versions in production is, like, massive, right? Because I can get, uh, we could even get to the point where I would just run half the service in production. 
right? Because the, 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 the turnaround was so quick that like updating a service like in production was like seconds. So I would just go like, oh, I'm about halfway through. I just want to make sure like, like after that sort of enriching step, when I've done the parsing and the validating and the, um, I've done sort of one or two sort of request API requests, like just to make sure that everything, that I have everything and everything is in the shape that I thought it is, I'll just uh, go and log it. And I would push that to production. And then run a couple of requests and looks at the logs and go like, this is great. This is exactly what I thought it was going to be. Um, and I would finish it. So yeah, not only would we push to production, we would push things to production that we knew didn't work. <laughs> right? Like, and that's the point that I want you to take away from this. Um, and at Cloudflare, that's sort of exactly the same, right? People sort of go like, oh, this is great because you did this uh, in, your, in your tiny little startup. Um, but like at Cloudflare, we run millions of scripts, um, which more importantly, like, we don't know how they work, right? So we can't test any of our customers' scripts because we don't know what they're supposed to be doing. Right? So yeah, we will sort of test and there's actually, in that particular thing, there's a lot of unit tests. Um, but even then, we will roll out changes very, very gradually um, to different sort of machines and slowly ramp up to see if anything like sort of breaks. And it doesn't happen very often, but occasionally it does right? when V8 decides to do uh, sort of interesting things. Uh, for example, like we, we, we can only catch that in production. Yeah, the only way we can find these things out um, is by throwing it against the millions of scripts. Um, so yeah, testing in production is the way forward, right? Um, the other thing that you're going to need here is like make sure that you can figure out what the hell's going on, right? So you need to have some centralized way of uh, looking at your logs, your traces, sort of. Observability is a big thing um, in here. This is a slide where you go, but surely, yeah. I'll throw something against the wall here. So this works really well when you have a greenfield build where you can do a completely bedroom architecture <clears throat> from scratch. The interesting one here is the how this kind of works when you're already dealing with some kind of monolithic solution, some other kind of solution where you're trying to integrate serverless within it, where you're trying to say, you know, we want to build a stack which will attach to this in some way to keep it in just dark process or whatever it might be. How you can actually do that without already having the right steps of the event driven architecture in place. Because a lot of this kind of comes back to the idea you want to have small functions, you want to be able to test those things in parallel, and you want to be able to hold all that stuff running. If you don't have the right architecture in place first, that becomes a little bit trickier. So I guess that would be the thought that's very deep there. What's yeah. your thoughts on that from that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we had like one part, like I said, that was uh, non lambda um which if it isn't already a word, we should totally make it one. Um, so like that was a that was a big Docker container that did a bunch of um, sort of really sort of important things. Um, so again, like that was like greenfield greenfield ish. Um, but basically, what we like a bunch of what we did there was um, like they were they were saving their stuff in DynamoDB, um, which is great because we then like took uh, like a stream of the DynamoDB table. Um, and that gave us sort of records as to like what was updated and when, and then we would translate that into into events for like the rest of the application. Um, so like yeah, that's that's sort of like where I would like sort of look in that sort of like monolith. Like how do how can we get the like the monolith to um, start like, like yeah? So either directly or or sort of indirectly. Later we did that directly into the code that was running into the Docker. Like it was sending out, it, it events sort of specifically to the, um, I think it was an SNS topic. Um, but yeah, like whatever, whatever you're using as your like sort of event messaging bus thing. Um, 
Yeah, because yeah, you have to look at the whole thing as a as a black box. Um, but as long as events like come out of it, I don't need to I don't need to know about the internals, right? And then and the other thing you can do then is like slowly start to, and that's like what we started to do then, is um, like have parts of the have parts of the monolith like react to events again. Um, and now, you, now we started to be able to like lift bits and pieces out of that by going, well, it reacts to this event and it sends this event. So huh, this is the bit that we can do in a Lambda. Right? It was clear that like, the bit here couldn't happen, but there was a bunch of stuff that we managed to like, strip out of that sort of as well as we went along. And even if you have that big chunky beast in there, if it's still part, if it's still consuming events and sending out events where it needs to, then you've still got that integration within the event of an after Exactly. Solution. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so in, in our case, like, we were actually kicking it off. Um, so it was like a, it wasn't a standalone application, but it was like the, the, the big thing sort of in the middle where everything else was sort of around. Um, and so, yeah, by having full control over the events going in and the events going out, um, we didn't care, um, except if you had to like touch the thing because suddenly we had to change existing code. And you're like, what's this? I need to write unit tests for this now. How am I doing for time, Sir Math? I have. Um, ah, jeez, easy. Um, so operations. Uh, how does this sort of compare when you start to do like sort of ops? Uh, and this is a great thing. Uh, you can go to bed if you're being paged, right? Because um, most of this stuff isn't your problem, like, um, like especially if you're building on Cloudflare workers. We, we have people that get paged in the middle of the night, uh, and they'll get up for you. Yep. Um, this is also something that's super scary. Like when you tell this to people and they are like, but my service is down. And they go, yep, yeah, it's, it's down. Yeah, that's, that's correct. But um, there's an army of people like working on fixing it right now. Um, so like, you don't need to. Right? And in general, those people looking after your sort of service platform um, are better at their job than you are, basically, what I'm saying. Um, certainly if you compare it to the entire stack, right? Um, you might be able to do the Kubernetes layer really well, but you're still running on VMs and storage solutions and sort of everything else. So yeah, you lose the ability to tinker with the underlying layer, and that's great. So here's where, so if I put on my sort of co-founder and sort of CEO hat on. This is where it gets like really fun. Like, where your devs sort of like do your serverless thing, easy, this is great. Um, but this is what I get excited about, right? Now, the first thing people do is they go like, ah, serverless is great because it's really low cost. And I go, yeah, maybe. Um, if you're starting out, it certainly is. Um, Pete showed, um, like, well, on the, well, he was doing the talk before me, said it was great. Um, he, he showed one of iCloud Guru's, uh, like, AWS bills from the, not early, early days, but, like, when they had, like, proper traffic, and it was, like, 5,000 bucks, all of which were egress fees and CloudWatch, <laughs> um, and then a tiny bit of Lambda, and some S3, and some other crap. Yep. So, Lower cloud spend is nice, um, but certainly if you get really big and really successful, you might pay more right? than if you ran the VMs yourself. Yeah. And that's entirely possible. Still not a reason to switch, but like, my point is lower cloud spend is nice, but what it's about is freeing up really intelligent and smart people to work on the problems that actually matter to your business, right? 
you, the business that you work in, makes money a particular way. And unless you also work for Cloudflare or AWS or one of the other sort of serverless providers, writing serverless platforms is not the way they do that. Yeah. So don't. Yeah. So this is what this is what the value is, right? Like it's about sort of freeing up people to go work on the on the problems that actually make money, or whatever you define as success, right? Like it's the same thing in non-for-profits or charities or like, it doesn't matter what, you're there to solve a problem. Have your people work on that, not on writing platforms. But here's where it gets really fun. Predictable and scalable COGS. Um, COGS uh, basically means uh, cost of goods sold. And it's an accounting term. Um, and it's basically the incremental costs of a delivery, right? Um, so like the pizza, the, the, the cost of goods sold is everything that they needed to make the pizza, like all of the ingredients, like the labor, sort of like all of that sort of goes into that, into the cost of goods sold of that pizza. We're not talking about the ovens or sort of like anything else. Yeah. To make one pizza cost me X. To serve a request, like this particular request, cost me X. Right? I can now go, this particular request takes on average, like it's, it's three invocations, it's a write to a DynamoDB table or a read from uh, like a Cloudflare KV, KV store. Like I can go, this is what it costs to service this particular request. This particular function, this particular service that I sell, I can now predict what the cost of that thing is going to be. And that scales linearly with my revenue at worst, right? Because I don't care if I do, like that cost is the same whether I do 10 requests or a million. Yeah. I get paid a lot more for 10 million of these than for 10. Yeah. So your spend, like you stop worrying about your spend. Right? You go, oh, like last quarter we spent $100,000 on serverless invocations and all of the data things. And you go, that's great, awesome. Because that means we made a lot of money. Because yeah. what you can basically do is get an incredible amount of pricing power. I can basically go, I would like to have a margin of X dollars, of X percent. So we're going to take what it costs and we're going to 10X that. And that's going to be our, like the pricing point that we're on. Sure. And then whether the client makes one call or one million call, it costs you the same. But now when we're switching to lambdas, every call counts. Does it cost you the same to do one in a million requests outside of a serverless context? The server is already there. You are yeah, there's it. one. <coughs> Does it handle the increased load of all your customers? Does it, do you need to, is there more, more, does it go wrong more often? Like, do I, am I going to be paged more often? No but, yep. Obviously, there are costs. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but that's my point. Yep. So you're paying an X amount of dollars for a server, and you know ahead, okay, this, I have two million in revenues from clients. I can spend one million or on a server, and then the client can do whatever he wants. Now, again, I'm not entirely familiar with the serverless. We're just starting to use it. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Let's say now that we discover that the client does way more requests than we expected. Now you need to change your, either your pricing or the way your whole revenue stream works. So, so the problem is exactly the same. So in your other scenario, like in your, in your current scenario, right? Like you have a set of virtual machines, mm -hmm. I hope, um, right, that you run your software on. 
And so like, you, can, you can sort of, you can basically calculate what your cost is, right? Because you just go, like, here's all of the requests that we handle. You can sort of fudge it, right? You go like, oh, like all of the requests sort of, it costs us this much to, um, uh, it costs us this much to um, service all those requests. So you still need to know exactly how much your customers use it, because otherwise you would either under or over provision your hardware. Right? So you already have, my, 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 the thing I'm trying to say is you still have this exact same problem, is that, but you don't know what your costs are exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. There's, um, we have this machine and it can do a million requests per hour. Right? Um, like what kind of requests do they do? Uh, it's a bit like they do a bit of everything, I don't know. Um, like how does it, how does it work? Um, like what about the database? Because that's on a different like machine, so we pay for that as well. Like how do we allocate the costs? Like so, you have right now you have this really big pool of costs, and you have no good way of like figuring out what any individual thing costs. Yeah. In a and the other thing is it doesn't scale linearly, right? Like every time something happens, you have to like you have to scale up. Like in a big, big way, like either an entirely new VM, an entirely new cluster, or an entirely new region, like depending on what you still want to do. Right? Um, whereas that all, all goes away. If I can go, this particular API request cost me a dollar per million requests. That particular API request cost me two and a half dollars per million requests. Right? Um, and being able to and th but then I can go and, and look at my request properly, right? Like on average, my customers do 10 million of this and 500 million of these, right? So now I can go look at individual customers and go, like, what's my margin like for this particular customer? Like this particular usage, should I like raise or lower my prices, right? And being able to do that on a customer by customer basis or an API by API basis. It's super, uh, super interesting. Um, like as a, as like a, a business person to go and when you look at your pricing, because I know what my bottom is, right? I can go. I'm going to sell this thing for two dollars per million requests. Like, can you service that? Like, I, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, maybe I don't know. Like, and that's that's the thing where. Sort of having that, like knowledge, uh, makes it really interesting to, like, compete. Uh, uh, just a small comment. I didn't have this experience myself, but uh, read uh, many funny stories from the internet. Sometimes uh, events produce non-linear number of other events. Uh, it's a sort of bad architecture, and the spend can be non-linear. For example, uh, if you use uh, a sort of aggregation function that is. Uh, that calls uh, other events, and, but anyway, uh, spend is not always linear. Uh, there are some there, uh, wrong, probably <laughs> from inside, but it's spent can be non -linear. Oh, of course, your spent can be um, like somewhat non-linear, but even the growth of that is relatively linear, um, right? Like, so like data storage is one of those things where like you accumulate storage, right? So you, so you. Like it gets bigger and bigger over time, and it doesn't really um, sort of become less. Yes, um, it's linear, but uh, there are, there are um, some cases where uh, well, I, I read stories on Medium where people pay uh, uh, bills like hundred thousand dollars for like rather stupid architecture. Yeah, uh, and, but uh, the, the, to be honest, like the, the I see that like the most often when they're looking at uh, serverless as as, as a function as a service, right? Because um, if you do that, it's really easy to get yourself in an infinite loop, uh, or at least a loop that sort of spirals out of control pretty quickly. Because um, this is a function that calls that other function that calls that function, but then it turns out that that calls this function as well, and uh, we're getting a lot of sort of invocations. Well, that's why like, they're not functions as a service. Like If you look at it from a, like a business, this is the, this is the event that happens. 
like, and then we're going to do this and that. Like, it's hard to get into. Like, there are there are definitely sort of exceptions to that. Uh, like, if you write analytics software over um, like historical data, like that's going to become more and more over time. But even that's fairly predictable in the way that like your data grows and thus your spend for that. Yeah, and so the other interesting thing, like compared with the virtual machines, is that for virtual machines you have your scale capacity to say, you know, we want to be able to handle 100,000 requests every minute or something like that. You know, because we want to say, you know, we know we're probably going to have about 90,000, but really we want to have some headroom for that. So we're always going to be paying for a little bit of wastage with the whole thing for serverless authentication sort of thing per event, then you can actually get that scaling exactly to what you need, and so you're never paying for any of the overhead of provisioning capacity, because that's all handled generally as part of the platform as well. So that's one yeah. of the parts for that. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's that sort of like scaling up, scaling down, is it, yeah, you don't need to keep any servers around. Well, early, early on in the, um, in the cloud, when the cl cloud adoption was happening, they did a study on the virtual machines, and the average virtual machine was 18% utilized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so they had all that headroom that you were, you were paying for, but you weren't using. Yeah, uh, and it gets like, yeah, like it's, it gets even worse um, like now, right? Like where, where like you put all of those on like, like, a, like the hardware is like similarly sort of utilized. Like there's insane low utilization and it's still orders of magnitude better than in most data centers, like because machines don't do anything in the in a data center, um, like VMs do at least something. Um, but yeah, like at Cloudflare, we run at like tens of percent, um, like CPU usage, um, as a as a matter of sort of course. Like, um, yep. So one thing, CFOs love that because they can see where all the money's going. And yep. CFOs yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and yes, that was my thing. Um, so, ah, this is the one thing I wanted to go, and my uh, battery is running out anyway. Um, so serverless is not the end, right? Like, it's that sort of thing where we've, we've grown basically up the entire stack. Um, and there's nothing else to give, right? Where right now we only write, like, the business logic um, that, we, that we need to. Um, the next step is to not write any code at all, right? And, and that's what, what we're seeing sort of over and over again is like, and what we're going to see more and more is this sort of like serverless and SaaS uh, where I'm going to hook into Stripe's events like, and do my thing. Like Stripe's going to do all the payment stuff. I'm just going to work off Stripe events. Um, and it's the same thing with a ton of other um, sort of SaaS providers where it now becomes super easy and customizable to get multiple SaaS vendors together. Um, and so, yeah, what we'll, what we'll start to see more and more of, I think, is sort of uh, what I call, um, like, you've seen this one already. It's a good thing you didn't show up on time. Um, uh, sort of like, like rise of the, like sort of like business as a service, right? Um, if you think of it, like Shopify, for example, is a business as a service. Right, like it's an e-commerce site, and that's it. Like I can spin up a new business in in a couple of minutes, and I can use these sort of serverless techniques to sort of go and add my bits of logic that I need for that particular uh, sort of type of business. So we're going to see business operations and probably like entire sort of businesses as a service. Um, sort of spinning up, uh, which is going to be really exciting. But that's it. And also means you don't get any time for questions because you should have asked them <laughs> during the thing. Thank you very much.